<laughs> okay. Um, so I, I think I should pull this to order. Why not? It's, uh, it's a little odd, but, um, so, uh, so I want to welcome everybody to their first beer and bagels. This is beer, bagels, and blockchain. Uh, we are live from San Francisco. Um, we're live from Zoo. Um, hi, Lucas. Uh, we're live from Bern. Uh, hi, Valerie. Uh, we're live from Trust Square. Um, hi, Friedrich. I see Thomas. That's great. Hey, Danny. Thank you for your time. Um, and uh, so I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, so it's not often that the value of other places for uh, inspiration, but right now, blockchain uh, is definitely happening in Switzerland. So uh, our role here at SwissNex is to connect uh, Switzerland to host markets and art, science, technology, innovation. I think this is a really good example of how Switzerland can help us lead the way and help us uh, change our perspective on what's new and what's fresh around the topic. Um, so, um, I want to, uh, again, it's, thank you very much for all coming here. Uh, Danny, thanks for your space in uh, Trust Square. It's good to see you. Uh, and uh, I think without further ado, uh, I'll, we'll kick this off. We could go to Valerie first in, in Bern uh, to uh, give us a little update as to uh, what's going on in Swiss Post uh, in, in Bern around blockchain. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, Simon. So, I just think uh, about the Swiss Post for the people watching from the South So, uh, the Swiss Post are a company. We um, work as, uh, in the communication and logistics market, and we're very, very honored to have this uh, title as the most possible company. So, we supposed to do a phone delivery for a podcast, for example. Uh, or in test with self-driving cars. And uh, we also own one of the biggest retail banks in Switzerland, Post Finance. So there we already have been involved in the whole blockchain topic for a while. So we have, for example, a case in the energy space where we have now in Switzerland have a lot of change so now uh, microgrids. The people who have a decentralized solution in the energy market, um, Post Finance offers pure transfer transfer pay for uh, payments in this decentralized market. And uh, another case that we were is in the smart uh, farm supply chain, where you make you know with the GDPR, so you have to make sure that the drugs are always transported within a certain Temperature range, and there we also collaborate with the startup model to um, work on that. Now I'm very curious to, uh, to hear what uh, we have to tell us and also again uh, people here in the discussion. So thank you very much for my side. <laughs> Uh, great, and and also uh, just to be clear as well, the questions will come from all around the world. So um, if you know, we we said raise your hand if you got a question and speak into the camera. But the whole idea is this is an interactive session, uh, and uh, we look forward to those international questions. Um, so let's cut to Lucas Etter in in uh, Zoo. Uh, so I've asked Lucas to give us an update as to what's happening in Zoo, uh, what uh, uh, what he's seeing in terms of the startup market there. Uh, and uh, over to you. Thanks. Sure. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, pleasure to, to be here today, live out of the, the Crypto Valley Labs. I'm actually in one of the meeting rooms. Uh, to tell a bit more about the, the current situation in the so called Crypto Valley. Well, we would say the, the tube is the, the very narrow term, and for other Switzerland and Liechtenstein, uh, we include that only in Crypto Valley. Yeah, sure. And uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the following points, very briefly about the evolution, how it came to what it is, then why to why now, and uh, most importantly, a third point uh, was how right now, in terms of regulation, business evolution, ICOs, etc. Um, but briefly about myself, I was born and raised here in Switzerland, and uh, after my master's, I, I pursued uh, Several years uh, working in investment banking as well as private and fund investing, and then decided end of last year to join Lakeside Partners, which is an early stage blockchain VC. Uh, 
to do it. I decided to combine my full time profession with my passion, knowledge, and investigating for entrepreneurship, venture investing, and multi for new technology, which especially is blockchain technology. And um, with Lakeside Partners, as mentioned, we, are, we, we invest in early stage in blockchain and crypto uh, companies, also multi companies, and um, we also help companies on the nice uh, from several perspectives. Further, um, where I'm sitting today, we built uh, the Crypto Valley Labs, which is a uh, similar to Trustware, and it is a very important space for, for blockchain uh, focused projects. Uh, by the end of the year, it was also an upcoming incubator, and the um, plan is to have a few hand picked uh, other labs in, in blockchain hubs all over the world, potentially San Francisco. Uh, on the, and on the East Coast as well as Singapore, etc. And uh, last but not least, um, we organized the, the Crypto Valley Blockchain Summit and Blockchain Competition on a semi annual basis, which is also a great tool uh, for to bring the ecosystem and community together. But uh, now to the, uh, to the important uh, part. Um, so, the evolution of the Crypto Valley, um, I think it's a fair assumption to say that. Um, Ethereum and Vitalik back in 2015 is one of the, the major responsible uh, people that uh, made the crypto valley what it is today. Uh, as a matter of fact, he, in, back in 2015, they incorporated the Ethereum Foundation here in Zug and worked on the on the platform in a big big house uh, uh, close here. And ever since then, many many blockchain and crypto companies followed. Uh, it's kind of a a magic magnet, I would say. Uh, nowadays, um, we have a tool uh, called the Crypto Valley Directory. If you can look up online, and we see that nowadays we have over 300 blockchain projects incorporated in two already. And in the broader crypto valleys, uh, in uh, Switzerland and Liechtenstein, there it's almost 500 and to date. And I mean, that's a truly fascinating uh, a movement to see, especially for such a small country like Switzerland. And this leads me over to why two by now. Um, I think this this is uh, several folds. Uh, it's it's on a, from a business perspective as well as a, an education perspective, and last but not least, governmental perspective. And they're all very uh, symbiotic. And the ecosystem here today uh, consists of entrepreneurs and builders, uh, visionaries, and really great projects. But last but not least, also service providers and investors. And uh, just to name, uh, let's drop a few names of, of projects. I mean, we have Aragon here, we have Shapeshift, Cardano, Bancor, Melfort, Lique, Proteins, uh, and that's to only name it. But, but why, why did this happen? I think there are several general aspects and several blockchain specific aspects. Um, the general are uh, very much, I would say, uh, the stability and safety and open-minded regulation that we have here. Um, if, as you might know, we have principle-based versus rule-based regulation, what you have in the U.S. And also the, the, the governmental bodies here, they, are, they seem quite goal-oriented, uh, responsive, and, and also a bit approachable. And last but not least, also crypto-friendly, if not almost steady. And uh, then, on the other hand, we have ETH Zurich, which is, uh, meanwhile, I think, uh, place number seven of the world <laughs> universities. Then we have Google with one of the largest uh, outside uh, uh, locations out of the US and many other uh, big tech companies. And uh, after all, Zug uh, is a very innovative and, and startup friendly environment. And um, then, for the blockchain, Aspect, um, I would say it's not only in the hero as mentioned before, but um, on one hand, we have now this rich, existing, uh, rich uh, ecosystem um, with important uh, projects, and and they also their decision makers are here, and they're bringing more and more people. And um, on the other hand, we also have rich capital in wheels uh, flowing into blockchain and crypto since very early on. And we have a dense network of uh, or a cluster of service provider that know blockchain, um, including international law firms. Uh, 
Um, even now, more and more established projects are moving here. Um, I think it would be great to have even more uh, also uh, for the developers, but generally the movement is really great. And to conclude, um, the ecosystem here, and I don't think I speak only for Duke, but for the entire Switzerland, especially also Zurich, the ecosystem is a very self, uh, self reinforcing uh, circle. That gets stronger and stronger by the day and attracts more. So, this leads me to the, the third point um, of what's hot right now. And I think we can divide there, for example, into the regulatory perspective. Um, what's really appreciated by blockchain companies worldwide is the, the stability of the regulatory framework. Uh, for example, we have in February. Uh, guidelines uh, published, um, more is said to come. Then um, another trend is the, the, the trend towards security or asset token, what you would especially call in the US security token, um, the classification thereof. And this is not only limited to, the, to Switzerland, but also all over Europe or even the world. And um, this also leads to the point that many companies right now are struggling with listing their tokens because either they just can't or don't want to list the tokens. But um, I think this is just a very uh, monetary thing uh, and uh, not overly concerning as several exchanges uh, are soon are soon to reach uh, regulatory approval. Um, so that's, uh, that's a really great um, movement. Then from a business world evolution point of view, uh, we see corporates being extremely interested in implementing blockchain technology and not just if it that's the stage of having MVPs or POCs, um, especially you know, all the banks and financial service providers, and insurance, real estate, one of the interesting use cases. Um, just as an example, there are several known uh, serious MVPs going on with, for example, Partners Group or Swiss Prime Site. Um, and um, funny enough, as mentioned before, more and more projects are looking to come to Switzerland, uh, even if they already raised money, for example, as they really um, appreciate the regulatory stability and uh, the existing ecosystem. And for us, Swiss, usually we're not really that aware of the stability um, as when someone tells us. And use cases. I mean, there's an incredible amount of really highly interesting and good quality projects. Um, I tried to, to collect a, a few that, uh, that literally popped into my mind. Uh, one has named before Modum, so it's a smart logistics solution for pharma. And SkyCell is in a similar space. Then, in terms of exchange projects, we have Licke, uh, which is really great, uh, and Shapeship. Uh, they are here. Decentralized governance and solutions. Um, Argo, that uh, is a really uh, impressive project that moved here in April. Uh, the tokenization of uh, IP and uh, AI with Mindfire project. Then the payment coin solution to overcome uh, restrictions of coins, uh, the Federcoin Foundation. And for example, also decentralized Airbnb with crypto grips. EID and government services with valid and complete uh, investment infrastructure with crypto finance, um, equity being tokenized, and, uh, as well as luxury assets with TENT, um, future of asset management with, with Mellon Park and Amigo Block, and last but not least, also what I mean, decentralized insurance, Easter is. And I think this could, uh, could go on and on and on. Uh, and without uh, losing the quality uh, of projects. And that is really, I would say, truly fascinating. Um, in terms of fundraising and ICO uh, point of view, um, we also see that businesses that do a fundraise are more established and more mature before they even think about looking at an ICO. It also has become much more um, difficult to comply with all the regulations. But Probably it always has been, but now it's a stricter enforcement. So, and also from an investor perspective, the, the idea of a white paper and a base ICO um, is, uh, is 
losing very much uh, of, of importance. And uh, in light of this, uh, MVPs and POC are strongly on the race, um, and it's almost a must nowadays before even thinking about anything in this field. Uh, also, we see companies that exist since a longer time to implement uh, their, 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 their blockchain or crypto in their business model, uh, still being startups. Um, and the tokenizing, tokenization of real assets and businesses, um, being it as a key of I am, was also uh, one of the, the games that are important uh, to imagine in the, in the future. Um, as an outlook, I would say the markets mature further, adoption rate grows, UX gets easier, um, projects get modernized and more mature, um, also kind of the sense of reality after the, the, the past months in the ICO race uh, uh, returns, and also um, I would say um, um, measurements from the old world of VCs uh, get, uh, get applied to those startups. Um, ICOs get smaller because sometimes it does not use to raise 50 or 100 million, it can also be kind of a burden. And um, potentially, we see also the bigger first acquisitions in the space, either coming from crypto companies or from other businesses acquiring crypto companies. Uh, maybe even the first corporate ICO in the uh, This, for example, be a corporate uh, launching a, a new product line. And also, the, the industry and initiatives are, are uh, becoming more and more serious. Uh, as an example, in Kriani, uh, which has been formed from with several insurances, is now becoming a kind of standalone uh, initiative for the, the, the future of insurance. So, I would say to, to conclude, um, overall, it's, it's, it will be interesting to see how the, the Second half of 2018 turns out, and where the blockchain crypto journey will head to uh, both in crypto value and on a global uh, basis. And uh, while one of these things, it seems clear that blockchain is, is here to stay, uh, but still remains unclear when the, when the mass wave or mass adoption uh, will eventually take place. As we know from, from tech history, this usually takes longer than, than is anticipated, unfortunately. But uh, I think the, overall the blockchain future seems, seems that, uh, to be right and truly bear uh, absolutely heartbreaking uh, possibility for, for people all over the world, especially also from emerging countries. And um, to, to come to an end, I think thanks a lot for, for your attention and for having me today at this webinar. I think it's a, a great initiative. Um, next time we will also organize a meetup here at the Crypto Valley Labs, like in, in San Francisco and Zurich. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to, to spread the news and developments from the Crypto Valley out into the world. And it's also one of my personal goals to foster the, the collaboration between the major hubs, especially in Silicon Valley or the US, uh, and for example, also Singapore. Because I think in the crypto world or blockchain world, everybody uh, can learn a lot from each other, and it's all about collaboration. And last but not least, if you have any questions, propositions, or collaboration ideas, uh, or a startup that needs to move to Zurich, um, please feel, feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, and uh, always uh, happy to help. That's great. Uh, uh, thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Lucas. Uh, let's open up some questions if, if we have any. Sure. Um, the, um, I'll open with one. If anyone does have a question, let me know. But what, what's the role of the VC? How's that shifted for you in the Crypto Valley with their easier access to capital with ICOs? Mm -hmm. uh, I think how the VC role will eventually uh, turn out is yet to be seen. It's a very, very ongoing process. Uh, what you have with, with ICOs, you basically need money in the, in the kind of a bridge financing for the ICO, or at least that was during the past months. So the VC get in very, very early on and kind of provide this bridge financing. Then also it depends really on the business case, if equity or tokens are 
turn out to be the, where the value lies of, of, of the business. If it's completely decentralized, most of the time the equity doesn't really provide any use. And it will be, uh, will be extremely interesting. Well, the development that we see right now is that we could see in the future uh, several stage ICOs, not a company raising 50 million at a time, but after they reach a certain milestone to another ICO or once get released, or they work in the first uh, three years with VC funding, and then the ICO is kind of becoming uh, the IPO or whatever you want to call it. Um, so it will be extremely interesting. I think generally it's the ICO will over time move to a later point of the lifetime of the startup uh, because it's just unreasonable or crazy what we've seen over the past months. Yeah, just to you know, don't speak to right here about that. The, All, the, right. The, the mic. All right. Could you get Simit on? Um, I my question is about you were talking about the openness of, of Switzerland, and I've I've looked at uh, starting companies there before. Um, what is, what is the current status of, uh, you know, what does it take to be able to move there and start a company or to get a work, fit and, uh, work permit and work for a company if you're non-Swiss? Um, well, me, myself, not being a, a governmental body, but um, what I hear from the other founders, it seems not to be overly uh, difficult anymore, especially if you really want to be on the ground here also bring people, invest in here. Um, so, and especially too, I mean, the, what I mentioned before, the government is really approachable. You literally can, can call the, econ the Department of Economics and, and uh, speak to them or the tax department. And I think right. that's usually, yeah. yeah. Um, and just to add to that, Greater Zurich area that uh, is a great resource there, the Valley Association. So there are, there are some really good in the past for understanding how to set the of what you need to do, what you need to file, how you need to incorporate, and so on. Uh, and with that, I think we'll we'll thank Lucas very much. Thank you very much. Uh, two two pieces of housekeeping. I forgot to uh, thank Ulrich uh, Vito here, our consul general. Thank you for coming today. Sorry, it was a pleasure. And this gentleman sitting next to me here is Brett Murray from uh, <laughs> from JP Morgan Chase. Hey, Brett. I, I'm just a spectator. Yeah, right. There you go. Uh, Okay, so I think then we'll, we'll, we'll shoot to Trust Square. Uh, and uh, so here, there we have Thomas Pushman, University of Zurich, um, Dan Geisinger, the head of, uh, of Trust Square, the founder there, and uh, Dr. Roman Tork. Uh, and I'll hand it over uh, to Thomas. Thank you very much. Yes, you would. thank you. Can you hear us now? We can. Perfect, great. So thanks for the, the initiative, and it's, it's, it's a pleasure for us to um, to join this conversation here and uh, spreading it across the, the four locations. So we were um, preparing uh, a little bit a short uh, and small panel discussion, and as you already introduced us, um, on my left side is Dani Gassteiger, who is the founder actually of Trust Square. Co-founder, co okay, thank you. <laughs> At least uh, it, it dates back very much to uh, some uh, ideas you had some some years ago. Uh, and you're not only a, a co-founder of Trustware, but also a, a founder of a, of a company that is a, a, a blockchain-based company. So, uh, or at least provides some blockchain-based solutions. Uh, uh, so you can talk from two angles, more more or less. And on my right hand side uh, is Roman. Uh, he is uh, in the executive board of um, also a blockchain startup that is based um, here in Zurich, uh, which is called uh, Deon Digital. And uh, they also jumped on that topic very early. And what I think is they are already looking for uh, a blockchain 2.0 sub solutions. So looking more into the smart contract uh, uh, topic here. So I think uh, two interesting persons. Uh, my, me and my uh, uh, role is more on the research and, and education side. So we founded the uh, FinTech Innovation Lab uh, almost two years ago at the University of Zurich in 
locally different uh, kind of disciplines there. So we have the, the law people there, we have the computer science people, uh, but also the banking and uh, finance people ta uh, taking part in, in, in that research. So it's also uh, something that is uh, part of the ecosystem here. So what we wanted to discuss is actually two questions. The one is on, uh, isn't that a contradiction that everything is becoming decentralized, although uh, the whole world is becoming more connected and globalization led us to, uh, let's say, more interconnections between nations. Uh, so this one that was, is, is the first question. And the other thing is what on, um, on the differences and also on the uh, commonalities we have between uh, the Silicon Valley on the one hand side and uh, the Crypto Valley, which we now extended to Zurich also to the Trust Square. <laughs> as you mentioned, it's, uh, as Switzerland is so small, the Crypto Valley is almost everything. Uh, so these are the two questions. And I would like to start with, uh, with the first one. Uh, uh, Tami, what is, what is your of, of our opinion on that? Uh, why do you think? Is, 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 isn't that a contradiction in, in itself? Uh, globalization on the one hand side and decentralization on, on the other hand. Um, welcome, that's a cluster. And I think personally, when it comes to the topic of blockchain, and um, Lucas said it all basically will come up to right when it comes to the Swiss aspects of this topic and what we are doing here. I think what not that we mentioned is that the Swiss political system is a totally decentralized system. So what we have here is a federalistic model where basically I'll just set up for enough discussion and uh, basically empowers individuals to be fully self in control about the politics in this country and uh, everybody can raise a popular initiative, everybody can vote on this. So this is kind of what blockchain is all about. And so I think while globalization has taken place and unfortunately at the moment it's, it's kind of in reverse mode when it comes to some more of the federal systems being re-established. Um, it's, it's not a contradiction, it, it actually adds to the, the to, to this, this whole movement, if you want. Decentralization, from my perspective, started, um, especially also when you know the history of, of Bitcoin directly after the financial crisis, and there's a reason why we probably started at that point in time, because the systems will become too big and too centralized, and that's exactly what Bitcoin is all about, to actually decentralize these, these mono, monolithic systems be it in the financial services, be it in, in some of the governments across the globe. And blockchain will make, make it has its biggest impact from my perspective in countries, not in the US or in Switzerland actually, but in countries where the, we are not as advanced when it comes to the political systems, be it financial inclusion, and all these things where these topics of, of, of decentralization make a lot of sense because we get powerful individuals that are currently not as privileged and as, as, as fortunate as we are here. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think this is uh, one one main as aspect also uh, from a, a nation point of view. Um, what what do you think from from the um, from from your startup and and what your clients expect? Is there let's say a kind of um, a killer application that you can see uh, that really spurs it? Because there are many experiments going around. Everybody is doing something, the incumbents are doing something, also uh, startups, as we heard, are ex experimenting in, in different kind of fields. Uh, in, the, in the web, uh, this was the, the email, was really the, the killer app. What, what, what do you think could, could be like the, the killer app, if there is one? So many thanks uh, for the question. Um, I don't want to, and I do not know what, what kind of killer apps we will see in the future, but I'm, I'm pretty certain that we will see a lot of these uh, killer, killer apps or these uh, systems that will evolve. What is uh, changing is, is the nature of how technology is, is brought into, into the world, so that no longer there needs to be um, one guy or one company to set up a platform. Most probably for the incumbent phase, it's still the case. But what we will see is that with the blockchain, we have now also the technology at hand that the, the system can organically grow 
meaning, and you mentioned it before, we will see them the second phase of the blockchain. Now, basically, we need to stop blockchain mainly in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the mass media. You only hear about cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and on whether the price is high or too high or too low. But I think this is the totally wrong section and a good question. The underlying technology of the blockchain is enabling that we have some kind of supercomputer where we can build logic on top, where we can connect people and not just share information, but where we can trace. And this is very important so we can really share this, this value asset. We are just starting to have um, um, e identities, we will have um, properties on, on this technology, we will trade these assets on these platforms. And this platform, most, some of them will be open source, let people build their services, products, and contracts on these on these um, election systems. And, and therefore, it's really uh, some kind of open platform where people can interact peer to peer without having a lot of intermediaries in between. And so it will, it will have impact in all of the industry, not just the financial industry, but also logistics and also in government. So we see a lot of these things. Maybe one, one additional question. Do you think there will be one blockchain for everything, or will we have the different kind of ones depending on the industry or depending on other characteristics? Um, I don't think that there will be this kind of monopoly that we only see one blockchain that, that fits all our needs. But, but what we will see, we will have different ecosystems with different purpose, uh, with, uh, with different people sharing and, 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 and um, uh, evolving this system. So we will have different ones as we have also uh, not only one Google, but we also have additional search engines. We do not only have uh, Amazon, but we also have Alibaba. And most probably, what we will see is that we will have uh, different blockchains. Maybe they, at some point of time, they will uh, be interoperability and we will be a result between this blockchain. But I, I think we have um, several ecosystems that will run in parallel, where there are different kinds of needs that can be served there. Okay. So much, much has been uh, talked about the, the future role of companies in these new ecosystems. Dani, you are also a founder of a company that provides services for, uh, for blockchain-based solutions. How, how, how do you think will, will this turn out? What is the future role of a, of a company? Everything is decentralized. And theoretically, you could uh, do everything peer-to-peer. Peer -peer. So why do we need any companies anymore? Well, there's also these new businesses need to be built to develop and um, fix some kind of open source technology and um, the masses will build the best systems as we've seen in the past already. But um, the services on top of these, of these systems, these blockchains, these protocols, they need to be built as well. And so there's going to be companies like what we are doing in the space of Ecoing solutions, digital identity, and I think coming to your question about killer app, I personally believe evolving is going to be one of the killer apps on the blockchain. The whole governance of such decentralized systems and how that works and how people can work together will go through processes like digital voting, online voting, systems that are enabling crowds to come together and decide on strategies. And so that's what we are looking on. We are basically closing uh, first phase of the based voting system that can then be used be it in corporate court, be it in government political votes. It's going to take some time until this is um, ready and uh, acceptable for governments, but I think that's going to be one of the big killer apps at the moment. Okay, that sounds pretty uh, interesting. So maybe we, we uh, switch to the, um, to the second question a little bit, uh, touching the um, differences and also uh, um, uh, let's look at what is really similar between the Silicon Valley uh, and also here in Switzerland on, on the other side. What is, what is your opinion? Uh, what, what do you think, as, as we have heard from, from Silicon Valley, you also hear that they go out from Silicon Valley and there has much been 
written about uh, at Silicon Valley. What, what do you think? Is this uh, going to be disruptive for the Silicon Valley? So will all uh, the, the, the good people now move to Switzerland? Or, or is this something, uh, there will be something here and there, and we'll also have Asia, as was mentioned before. How do you think uh, will, will this turn out? <clears throat> so I think, um, about people from Silicon Valley who want to speak to the world and love them. I think uh, um, also Silicon Valley and, and, and the term the companies in Silicon Valley, they will they will um, feel the, the competition that is growing. And it, it's like life balance and the financial industry that is now um, being um, more aware that there is a new tech technology that can really uh, change how things work today. We have the big companies in Silicon Valley, and they also all of them have their blockchain and, and projects running. But I don't think that the, the, the huge innovation is done by these huge companies. Neither we will see this innovation be done by banks, nor we will see this uh, innovation be done uh, by the, the huge companies that are now in Silicon Valley. And I think one of the most important reasons why Switzerland is well uh, positioned uh, for the future is the first the culture that has already been mentioned. Um, and, and the second thing is that we have a regulator who has had done his job um, very early on and um, really cutting down the uncertainties around the ICOs, around cryptocurrencies, and really uh, putting in place uh, the rules. Uh, you, you, you need to um, um, you, you need to adapt when you when you uh, run a company and you need to kind of build up um, uh, blockchain uh, blockchain solutions. And I think this is very crucial. And at the moment, I I, I fear or I have the impression that uh, in, in, in the regulators in America are, are not that clear, and especially for the investors to to really invest in that because they do not know what will happen. In, Three months, six months, twelve months, and I think this uncertainty is some kind of um, um, hindering this innovation and this investment. Okay. Um, we all have uh, uh, opened the trust square only a few months ago, and, and it's already crowd crowded here, so uh, uh, there is all, almost no space left. So there, there is a big demand uh, here. Also, on at, 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 at Trust Square from both our startup companies to really go into these new technologies. Where do you see the differences and also the similarities between the two places? I mean, first of all, I have to say that um, I was inspired four years ago when I started looking into the topic of blockchain and Silicon Valley to get uh, connected. At the time, it was, as we heard, Ethereum here. We had uh, the, the community around Zoom, which was thankfully. Supported heavily by the government of Zoom and the city of Zoom to basically experiment with this technology and support it without a um, big red tape around uh, Bitcoin and stuff like this to be, to be accepted, even as, as an official means of payment. And that opened so many doors. Also, on a national level, the tax authorities started thinking about it, and now it's a currency, and you basically declare your Bitcoin and your Ethereum holdings, and maybe you declare your dollars holdings and your other shares that you hold in your portfolio. So, the regulation is the big thing, and I'm 100 convinced that's where where we have an advantage. Vis-a-vis -vis the Silicon Valley, vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. as a whole, and vis-a-vis -vis other countries across the globe as well, and that's that's the big differentiate differentiate at the moment. People are moving more to countries like small small countries like Malta, Dubai, all these these other small innovative places are catching up or sometimes surpassing us, but. We still have one big advantage, and that was also mentioned already, and thanks to you, Thomas, from the University of Zurich, and thanks to ETH, we have these world-class universities here that, that help us generate the flow of new talents that are particularly interested in joining new startups like ours, like mine and God, versus uh, the old camps and everybody wanted to go into consulting and finance and financial services. And so that trend also helps us here. And so we have a small base that we start from. Silicon Valley has huge corporations, everybody wants to work for Facebook or Google or what have you. But um, we have a small start in advantage here thanks to the regulation. And um, 
I'm very happy that, that we have that because we have very regional delegations here uh, from also from the US. Um, we have served the management team here, including Jeremy last week for a full day. We have had a Chinese delegation yesterday from Brazil, a delegation. So everybody sees that and that gives us a head start, let's say, um, compared to the Silicon Valley and the topic of blockchain. Yeah, thank you, uh, you two. Uh, for this insights, and I think I, I, I would agree that the political system and, and regulation might be a differentiator uh, uh, compared to, to other locations. And so we are, of course, looking forward uh, to hearing from uh, San Francisco what, can, what you think about the crypto valley in Switzerland and what you think differentiates and what is similar. Uh, so thank you from our side here, and uh, yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, any questions from anybody uh, to pose? Um, turn that back. And I think uh, that's great. Uh, Thomas, Danny, Carolyn, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, so, uh, turn over to San Francisco. And here I have Brent Barry, who's the executive director and chief of staff for the chief experience officer at JP Morgan Chase. It's a good title. Um, <laughs> it's a little wordy. Yeah, it is a little wordy. Um, so, I, I can't help myself but start off with the Jamie Dima, Diamond, uh, you know, his comments about Bitcoin. Yeah, right. Um, maybe a little background for those of you who hopefully weren't paying attention. Um, so, Jamie Diamond's the CEO of JP Morgan Chase. Uh, we're the largest bank in the United States. Uh, we have a quarter million employees. We have about $2.6 trillion under asset, asset management. We have $3 trillion go through our system every single day. We're pretty big. Jamie is looked at as um, kind of one of these Wall Street guys that everybody looks to as a barometer on these things. Um, I won't say Jamie's wrong, uh, but I will say that Jamie, uh, you've seen his thought evolve. He's gotten a lot more quiet on the topic lately. Um, I think that there's a realization that Crypto is here to stay. Blockchain obviously is becoming an amazing tool that anybody who has technological foundations can use. Um, Chase, you know, we we are not dabbling in cryptocurrency in an active way right now. The main reason, honestly, is because Jamie is so watched. If he were to say, I find it interesting, that could shift pricing. That could move markets. It's a really dangerous thing. Um, we did a really good job back in the back in 2006 and 7 avoiding subprime loans. That's why we came through the downturn so well. Um, and th there's a strong realization that we could we could sway things. So that's my understanding is his his tone is extremely cautionary to skeptical. And I think given the price volatility we've seen on Bitcoin in particular. Um, so that's so it, it kind of leads me to the private banking wealth management, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are, particularly in Swiss instance, there are, there's a need or a necessity to access the market for private banking. Yes. Uh, what's the role of, you know, how does that fit into that equation? How does it all fit in? Um, well, I, I, th I think it's probably worth a step back um, to, to talk about that. So Lux did a great job of kind of giving a state of the state of all things of blockchain and, and crypto. Um, I was, I'm actually amazed how much I agree with everybody here, um, which is, which is awesome because it shows that there is kind of a, a unified mindset towards all of this moving forward. Um, the usage models for, for these things is really what's shaking out right now. And we have to, I think everybody here who's interested in this is sophisticated enough to keep crypto separate from blockchain. You know, blockchain is evolving like the cloud. You know, it it will serve a purpose. It will make things work better. It will lead to, and this is what I'm concerned about, is better user experiences. So um, just as a little bit of background, I do work for a financial institution now, but I've been living and working in Silicon Valley for 24 years. I've worked for Apple, TiVo, NVIDIA, Nokia, um, Palm, if you go back far enough, and a bunch of startups in between. And what what I have found fascinating and it's guided a lot of my career is what's going to be good for the end user? What, why does this technology exist? And things like logistics, um, tracking insurance policies, account information, digital identity, all of these things are 
what blockchain is going to be amazing for this distributed model where these things are secure and can live everywhere and nobody has control but you start to give for example with identity control back to the end user yeah and this is the user experience driven perspective of the opportunities around blockchain i think is a a clear kind of uh, value set that the Silicon Valley can play catch up to the crypto valley. Um, yeah, it's driven so many decisions around the, the large organizations we have now. Yeah, uh, trust as well. You kind of we all touched upon these pieces as well about decentralization yes. and trust. Large banks, you know, trust is definitely an issue for plenty. There. It, trust is an issue for some more than others. Right. Um, we're, we're fortunate to have decent trust. Uh, Wells Fargo here in the United States is definitely, they have a whole ad campaign around trust right now because they've, they've made some missteps. But yes, the ability to seize more control of your information is something that blockchain has a lot of promise for. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because you're, you guys, you know, we're talking about what's the situation in the Valley right now. I think we have a hangover right now. I think 2017, there was this huge run up. Everybody was watching all these cryptocurrencies flourish. Um, it was a big drunken mess. And here we are on the other side of it. Uh, you know, there's the Gartner hype curve that everybody talks about. I think we had the fastest run through the Gartner hype curve on Bitcoin that we've ever had in, in history. We kind of went up, we had our little bear trap, we go way, way up, and now we've come out of the trough of disillusionment. And now it's time to do the hard work. Uh, there's way too many tokens and, and currencies out there. People need to stop inventing new ones and start using the ones that are out there, contributing to the communities that are making these things stronger, better, upgrading them. I mean, you look at the active work going on around Ethereum. Um, there's, there's real things that are being folded into the existing currencies. There's, not everything has to be tokenized. And at the same time, blockchain itself, this is, so I think as far as Switzerland and, and other places like Malta, even Puerto Rico in the United States, because it's a territory, not a state, um, crypto is flowing elsewhere. The regulatory environment here is a mess. Um, our government's a mess. Uh, totally separate thing. San Francisco, safe statement. Um, so, but, uh, so blockchain itself is where, where the Valley will do well. I mean, we've got tons of developers. We've got lots of investment dollars. We've got yeah, because the money's flowing. I mean, the money is totally flowing. They're they're getting in early on the major ICOs. They're getting in early on companies that are developing around blockchain, and that to me is a leading indicator of the catch up, mm -hmm. uh, particularly around the the way that the VC market goes. Right. And ICOs here, they they still exist, but anybody who's doing them is doing them at their own risk. I think everybody who is doing them towards the tail into last year, um, they, they're they they're watching their back, they're wondering if the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US is gonna come knocking. Um, it's ICOs, and, and by the way, ICOs represent a problem in the traditional Silicon Valley model. Uh, the Silicon Valley model has been, you have to stand in front of investors, prove your value, prove your business case, and slowly, organically grow and grind it out and, and get, pull in money as you go. Every time a Silicon Valley company has been handed $50 million on day one, they fail. There is, I can't think of it, if anybody in the room can, I can't think of a single example that's been handed a bucket of money and succeeded because they're not hungry. They're wasteful. They get stupid real estate. They hire too fast. They, they bloat and they die. Mm -hmm. Earning your way along. And I think the, the other thing that's really kind of interesting, everybody around here, um, I hear anybody who's been here long enough compare it to the dot-com era where there was just a proliferation of silly ideas and then reality hits. And I, I think one of the lessons that we need to take from our own history here is, um, you know, the gold rush in California was 1849. A bunch of people came from all over the world to, to grab gold and, and hopefully get rich and go home. Um, most of the 49ers left poor. The ones who made lots of money were the ones who sold them the shovels, the picks, mm -hmm. and all the tools. So be the one that brings the tools. Don't be the one that goes mining. Yep. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, there was something that we kind of raised earlier on, I think, is kind of the API to blockchain paradox, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's, if indeed blockchain is similar to a cloud mm -hmm. in its perception, um, there, the idea that you can access that data and understand that data with an AI level kind of analytics is a little bit of a disconnect between blockchain and, 
an API. So the times when APIs are a better solution. Yeah, oh, I mean, look, look at the cloud. I mean, yeah, everybody, I don't know how long ago that was, because um, it's all blur, but five years ago, cloud, 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 cloud's amazing. Um, the cloud has advantages, centralized databases have advantages, distributed ledgers have advantages. There's speed and things like that are, are issues on distributed ledger right now. Um, that's getting solved. There's, there's all kinds of lattices and things like that that have been developed. We've got um, uh, things that are, are definitely pushing way more transactions than they were a year or so ago. So that's all going to keep improving as technology does. Um, but it's all going to have its place in the technological ecosystem. They're going to be they're going to be tools that developers pull off the shelves and use in different ways. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that thing is it. I always think of the blockchain solutions as part of your tool belt. Yeah. Right? It's a deploying it at the right time, and that's that's how you, how you'll succeed. Yeah. Okay. So where's the competition coming from for for a large financial institution? Like yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is worth talking about. There's a little bit of a myth out there that the banks are going to die because of blockchain and, and cryptocurrencies. Um, mm -hmm. Will it hurt the bottom line of, of banks like Chase? It, yeah, it's going to impact bottom line most likely because we make money off of transactions. We make money off of lots of things. Um, most of our money does not come from transactions. It comes from other things, loaning, loaning money, um, working with equities, all these different things. So. It's not an existential threat to the banks in the sense that the banks are going to go away. Not more so than any startup could have been several years ago. I mean, we, anything large is a target and up for disruption. Um, so it, it doesn't threaten us because we, we hold wealth and we loan it and somebody has to give you your mortgage and all of that. Could you decentralize it? Absolutely. There's a business model there. Um, but it's one that somebody's going to have to grind out and prove. And, and get mind share and, and all of those sort of things. Um, the real threat, as I'm sure most of the people here know, is really the central banks as far as cryptocurrency goes, taking the power away from, from the Fed and the United States and, and things like that. And that's, that's spooky and that's disruptive. Uh, as far as banks go, honestly, it's fintechs in general that we, they're the barbarians at the gates. Just Robin Hood chipping away. It's, it's borrow money in terms of banking. Exactly. Shout There's Revolut coming out of Europe. There's Robin Hood in the United States. There's a bunch of different fintechs that have done some things very well and very right. And they will always move faster than us. We have, we have huge staffs. We have lots of regulation. We have lots of internal policy. Um, we've got a lot of legacy that we have to live with. And those guys are moving really fast. And I think um, one thing for anybody who's, who's thinking about doing fintech type stuff in the United States, our regulatory environment is so heavy, you have to know how to build from the ground up for that. Um, Robinhood, you mentioned. Uh, so Robinhood, based in Palo Alto, they started out as um, their feeless trading uh, of stocks. They're really going for a younger audience, which was very smart of them. Um, they have moved into cryptocurrency trades, which is which is now another revenue stream for them. Um, they will eventually move into doing loans. They will move into doing other things as they get more capitalized. Those guys were smart. Stanford grads went to Wall Street, built transaction systems for years, figured out that how to build for regulatory environments, and now they've built their stuff from the ground up for that. I think that goes to the success of, of, of Switzerland. Um, so if you follow the track to incorporation, if you follow the regulatory environment rules, you'll set up uh, for success. Yep. The last question, I think we're running out of time here, uh, is that, um, okay, you're, you're a blockchain startup. Uh, what, um, and you want to be acquired by a big bank. What makes, what makes you attractive? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so there's kind of different levels of that. One is, again, build for regulation from the ground up. If you haven't done that, all you're doing is creating a proof of concept. It's, you can create something nifty and, and shiny, but if it doesn't plug into our systems, if we have to rebuild it from the ground up, then we're buying your IP, we're buying your engineers, we're buying your staff, we're not buying your, your actual code. Uh, the best thing you can do for a bank is give us a jump start. Help us be competitive against all these fintechs that are, are crowding in from all sides. And again, you have to build it from the ground up with acquisition in mind. And, and you have to do that just to survive anyways, because as you get large enough, 
you're going to come under SEC scrutiny, um, and, and you just have to have to. Uh, it's for your own long-term survival and viability. Yeah, we talked about the proof of concept in a box. If it's a standalone proof of concept. You know, the likelihood of it being accepted further on is, is pretty small. Right? Yeah, I've, I've been at some very successful companies. It was at Apple. I've been at some companies that um, may they almost rest in peace, like Nokia. And Nokia, one of the things, I worked for the chief technology officer at Nokia, and one of the problems was all of our exploratory programs, all of our kind of internal startups were built in little sandboxes without looking at what the production systems were. And they would choose their own database, choose their own dev tools, and then they'd show up to the product side and say, look at what we built. Isn't it a pretty baby? And it's like, they can't live here. It, it doesn't work. We couldn't plug it in and push it to market. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, to put a bow on this, the interoperability the blockchain solutions might provide for is a good hedge for that. Uh, Oh, a question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, if this is a threat towards centralized bank or federal banking, why, what's the incentive for a fintech company to want to plug in to the existing systems? Can you the question? Sorry. Uh, yeah. So the question is, if this is a threat to centralized banking, why, why would a, a startup want to plug in to if centralized that's their systems? Goal, anyway. If that, yeah. I mean, honestly. I mean, I think it goes back to the fundamental motive of, of the startup. Are they trying to be a global power? Are they trying to be US-based? Um, I think European startups come at this from a very different angle. Um, the motive is honestly where the revenue is going to flow from. Um, if there's plenty of startups that are angling towards crypto, and that's one revenue stream. We see it on shaky ground here. Um, if you're plugging into blockchain, that and you want to work with actual U.S. dollars, that's a different angle. So it really depends on where you, where you see kind of the value of what you build and, and where you're going to rely. Question number five. You want to come up here? No question. As well, you may ask awkwardly behind us. <laughs> so this is actually for you. Uh, you mentioned how Robinhood is having success and how it's kind of a smaller, more flexible startup as compared to J.P. Morgan. And I think we've seen like a lot of startups these days are very flexible and they can move around very fast and kind of change direction. So I guess my question is, in a decentralized environment, like, I don't know, anything built on blockchain, there's generally governance problems where it's very distributed. Mm -hmm. It can be kind of hard to like navigate and move quickly in these spaces. So how do you see that like comparing to these startups where we've seen you know, they have to be very nimble, but a lot of these big decentralized blockchain startups are fairly not nimble. So yeah. how do you see that working out? No, you're, you're totally right. I mean, uh, I think an example based in San Francisco that everybody remotely would know of is Ripple. Mm -hmm. So Ripple is based in San Francisco. They've released a token called XRP, and they are accused often of being too centralized. And part of the reason why they do that is because it gives them control. Um, you could you could argue that you know they're hoarding tokens and they're going to use it as a continuous revenue stream, all that. But there is that tension. There is absolutely that tension, and it's kind of the tension between a startup that's developing a technology that's very proprietary and then somebody who's leveraging open source. You know, these things there's governance models that have existed before that need to be adapted, but can work. And if you look at the, the communities that have formed up around Ethereum, even Bitcoin, even though that's a mess, we all know that, um, you can see that progress can be made, but how you approach it is, is definitely still being sorted out. But it's going to, it does slow people down if you're not completely controlling your own chain. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any, any more questions anywhere? Swiss post. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, the host. <laughs> you get to introduce the Switzerland. He's offering all of us citizenship. <laughs> we'll take it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for this initiative. And I really have a question. Um, blockchain, I have arrived two months ago from Montreal, also a very creative, uh, active uh, industry there. And I'm impressed. Uh, the vibration here in the Silicon Valley, but also what Switzerland can provide. Um, blockchain is always connected to the financial 
industry market, but I also heard on the side it serves all the industries, or that's the vision. It will be, for example, for Switzerland, it is certainly a finance place of, of world reputation, but a prime industry, for example, is engineering. It's a pharma industry, life science. For example, how can life science pharma industry take advantage of the blockchain technology? Yeah, and the logistics, uh, traceability, um, there are the idea of customer data or, or, or patient data. Um, so new ways in which you can connect the patient experience to technology. Um, so you can, you can address your own uh, personal health outcome if you can share that data. Data is better in aggregate. Uh, and so those are, those are interesting kind of advances. With insurance, B3I is a really good example from Switzerland about uh, remediation. So cutting, cutting payment times down substantially over time uh, for billions of dollars of savings. Um, so I almost think the financial services will follow after a lot of other industries uh, because of the, uh, the margins and the ability to, to create uh, uh, cost savings and return much quicker. And our legacy systems and the fact that we need to make sure that anything we implement is completely bulletproof mm -hmm. because if, you know where there's money, there's your target. Not only money, it's also the life science. Yep. Uh, yeah. 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 Great. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, then I think with that, uh, it's a wrap. I want to thank Valerie Redo and Bon with Swiss Post, uh, Lucas Edda, uh, Lakeside Partners in Zurich, uh, Thomas, Danny, and Ronan at Trust Square uh, in Zurich, uh, Brad Murray. I'm Stephen Redding. I'm your host. And thank you very much. And, uh, and good morning, good evening. <laughs> <laughs>
I personally probably have once in a while. I do. And the year I decided what the mortality is, the credit card point system got out of line or whatever it is. Yeah, definitely. It's way better to get someone else's I was surprised, of course, that 